ICS Wednesday seminar and uh, to our speaker, I should say good morning um, because I believe it's about 8.30 in the morning there. Um, at the outset, I would like to welcome or should I say welcome back uh, our speaker Arunab to this forum because he is quite familiar with ICS and uh, has interacted a lot with us. And I want to thank him uh, for agreeing to talk on the subject of his really remarkable book, which uh, has a, also a remarkable title, I think, um, called Making It Count, uh, Statistics and Statecraft in the Early People's Republic of China. So I know that he's been in great demand to speak at various universities and uh, research institutes uh, all over the world ever since this uh, book came out. And I would have thought that he, is, he would be tired of speaking on it. So I was uh, very pleased that he willingly agreed to talk to us here about it. Now, uh, you know, Arunab is an old friend of ICS and he really doesn't need an introduction to you know, many of us here. But for the record, let me say that uh, he did his uh, doctorate in Columbia University. And his thesis there, his doctoral thesis there was the uh, basis for the book, which we are going to be discussing today. And uh, fairly shortly after he completed his uh, doctorate, he joined the faculty of Harvard University, where today he is an associate professor in the history department. Uh, Arunab's uh, research interests, correct me if I'm wrong, are broadly in the area of um, history of science and statecraft, which is what we are talking about today, China, India history, and also more broadly, uh, transnational history. So in my view, he's one of the really, you know, upcoming scholars of uh, modern Chinese history today, and it is a privilege to have him with us here. Now, you would have all uh, read the abstract of today's talk, uh, but before I ask Arunab to speak, I would just like to say that the work that uh, he has done on statistics in China of the 1950s is really pioneering stuff. I haven't seen uh, you know, this subject in this area covered uh, in so seriously and so well in such a long time. In fact, in recent decades, the subject of state building in modern China has uh, been focused mainly, I would say, on the late Qing and uh, the Republican period, or else uh, the focus has been more on the post-1978 reform period. And the Mao, what we have, we have called for short, the Maoist period, has been treated as something of an aberration, and till recently, I would say, interest in it had somewhat faded into the background. But with his thoroughly researched and deeply analytical study, Arunab has shed new light on the fascinating developments in this crucial period of China's history, shorn of uh, you know, Cold War blinkers and you know, polemical baggage, which you know, usually accompanies studies or has accompanied studies of this period. Um, he has looked closely at how a new state determined to refashion China's economy and society, struggled to set up a system to know the society through numbers, as he puts it, which was of course a precondition for the development of the planned economy and for the implementing the five-year plans and so on. So in the process of this study, Arunab has also uncovered for us a significant but hardly discussed aspect of modern India-China relations. Um, and I think for the sake of this audience, he's going to, uh, focus on this part a little more. As Chinese statesmen and statisticians in the 1950s turned to Indian statistical methods and Indian statisticians to try and help them overcome some of the problems that they had encountered. So it's really a gripping story. And uh, frankly, I never thought I would have enjoyed a book on statistics so much. <laughs> okay, and that's a uh, credit to you. Now we have left it up to the speaker to decide uh, what part of his research he wants to share with us today. And we know that half an hour is hardly enough time to present the wealth of information and analysis in this book. But I hope that some of the aspects that uh, the speaker may have to leave out or gloss over 
uh, can be discussed in a little more detail uh, in the question and answer session. So those of you who would like to pose questions to the speaker after the talk, please enter them in the chat box or else use the raise your hand feature. And we'll try to accommodate as many of you as we can at the end of the talk. So with this, I would like to hand over to you, Aruna. Great, <clears throat> thank, thank you, Madhavi. Thank you for such a, such a generous uh, introduction. And uh, you've, I think, made my, my job a lot easier in terms of <laughs> even talking about the book by encapsulating it so, so brilliantly. Uh, I, I also want to thank uh, Ambassador Kanta, uh, Rija Nair, and, and Saman Vehuda for uh, you know both the invitation and and all the logistical help that has gone into to making today's uh, meeting possible. Uh, as as Madhavi mentioned, um, I, I'm, I've I've been a, a regular visit to the to the ICS, so it's it is a particular pleasure to be be back. It is uh, even more a pleasure because I think I. It was in 2013 uh, when Professor Manoranjan Mohanty invited me to do uh, uh, to deliver a, a talk at the Wednesday seminar, and I had just come back from um, about 15 months of field work in China and about uh, three four months in India, uh, and I was beginning to put together a lot of the material that then went into the book uh, that is now out. Uh, so it's, it's it's especially nice to be able to return uh, eight years down the road and and in some ways offer a much more sort of complete version of I think what I presented. Um, eight years ago, sort of very preliminary, preliminary uh, thoughts. Um, uh, so as, as, as Madhavi mentioned, uh, the book really has a, has a simple question uh, underlying it. Oh, I forgot. Let me actually uh, share my screen so that you can at least see the cover as I talk. Um, so uh, the screen's visible? Yeah, okay. So, uh, so as you can see uh, uh, from the title, uh, uh, the book is set in the 1950s and it's, it's, it's trying to engage with a fairly simple question, which is uh, how did uh, the, the CCP and the PRC state that was uh, established in 1949 get about, go about getting to know the country quantitatively uh, because uh, so much of the change that the, that, this, that the Communist Party had envisioned for a new China was predicated on using planned means to bring about that change. And planning in some ways presumes that you have data to work with because it's fundamentally a quantitative exercise. So the book really becomes uh, in some ways a meta question. It's not so much about how does planning take place, but how does the, the data that is needed for this entire sort of socialist enterprise, how is that data even uh, 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 produced? And what is, the, what is the rationale behind that data? And in, in, in sort of exploring these questions, I end up engaging with a, a whole range of themes, um, themes like uh, state capacity, um, the, the sort of various histories of socialism, uh, 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 something about the history of planning in the PRC, uh, questions of, uh, that relate to the history of data more broadly speaking, and of course also Cold War science and how, we can, how this particular case helps us understand aspects of Cold War science. So uh, in, in normal circumstances, I have a fairly uh, potted version of the talk that I do, uh, that I deliver, which is, but, but given that, you know, we're uh, at the ICS and, and uh, th there's a greater interest in sort of China, India amongst, uh, I would presume amongst our audience members, I sort of rejigged re the talk so much to, somewhat to focus uh, or use as an anchor uh, what is uh, one particular aspect of the story, which is exchanges between Chinese and Indian statisticians, especially in the second half of the 1950s. So what I'll do is I'll try and sort of talk through that uh, series of exchanges and then uh, sort of uh, take a step back and try and explain why they were significant to uh, the history of statistics, why they are significant to the history of statistics in the 1950s, but also why they were significant for me in terms of doing the research and recognizing uh, what I could learn from these exchanges uh, uh, in terms of interpreting uh, the kinds of choices that Chinese statisticians were, were, were facing. So, uh, so let me let me dive right in uh, and, and and sort of proceed with that. I have about half an hour, so I, I want to stick to that to the extent possible, uh, so that we have enough time for for Q and A. So I want to start off in sort of um, uh, as I think what's known as in media's res, right? Sort of jump into the middle of the story and not sort of give you any more context. Uh, and and and, uh, and 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 the moment is December 9th, nineteen fifty six. Uh, John Lai is on a on a tour of India. This is a you know a formal a diplomatic tour that he's on. Uh, but, uh, but in December, he's in Calcutta, and on December 9th, he visits the Indian Statistical Institute, where, uh, as you can see in the photograph, he's led around uh, by the director of the Institute, P.C. Malanobis, who's the gentleman in the shawl pointing at the machine. 
uh, and uh, and sort of uh, given a tour of the kinds of activities they're doing. Now, for those of you who may not know, and I presume in this audience, this will be uh, information that is uh, quite familiar. The Indian Statistical Institute was set up in 1932 uh, by PC Malanobis and a few other uh, people in Calcutta. And by the 1950s had become one of the premier institutions that was uh, doing research into uh, various kinds of statistical methods, but in particular into a large scale random sampling, which they had begun to in the 1930s itself, employ in the field to collect all kinds of, of, of social and economic data. And by the 1950s, they were a sort of a, a, a globally recognized center for this kind of research and this kind of application. So uh, Joan Lai visits, and uh, as it turns out, the visit's supposed to be very, very short, sort of perfunctory half an hour visit, but he ends up spending a lot longer. He is extremely excited by what he sees uh, in, the, in the room where uh, Malanobis introduces the National Sample Survey, uh, which is one of the, uh, the innovations from, the, uh, from earlier in the dec decade that the ISI has, has, had instituted. Uh, Joan Lai basically sits on a desk and refuses to leave until all his questions are answered. So he's, he's visibly excited by what he sees, and as he's leaving, he basically uh, grabs hold of Malinobis and says, uh, we must have an exchange of, of, of scientists and statisticians because uh, what we are doing in China, we would love to learn some of these methods and apply them uh, in, in the Chinese case. Uh, so this is a, a fairly pivotal moment. I can, I can speak of it in very evocative terms because Malinobis writes about this to Pitambar Pant in a letter and provides a lot of detail about this visit and about John Lai's interactions or his interactions with John Lai. But what happens after this is that you have a series of exchanges that get kicked off. Uh, the, and these exchanges, I'll, I'll map them out in a moment, uh, but these exchanges get kicked off and, and lead to a, a, a sort of a whole range of knowledge uh, sharing. But before I, before I do that, I want, to, I want to remind everyone that this was, this was a really surprising moment. Uh, this was a surprising attitude to see from John Lai himself. And it was even more surprising to see him so, so sort of strongly uh, uh, ask for and in some ways, uh, some ways say that they will pursue um, uh, a series of exchanges. Uh, and the reason for that is, uh, if you look at earlier in the decade, uh, there had been attempts from uh, the Indian side, again, in particular, Malanobis um, himself, to try and bring China into global discussions on statistics. So for example, in 1951, India played host to the 27th session of the International Statistical Institute's biennial conference. And uh, China participated, but sort of in a very perfunctory way. Malarobis uh, expended a fair amount of energy to invite them, uh, but in the end, they deputized uh, the economist Di Chaobai, who was already in India on a cultural delegation, to go and attend for a day or two uh, this, this conference. But beyond, beyond sort of the perfunctory attendance and sort of the, the relative disregard uh, for, for these kinds of activities, uh, Di Chaobai also delivered a statement that sort of began to hint at why there wasn't the kind of... Uh, why the, 50, the, the kind of enthusiasm in 56 would seem to be so out of place. So just to quote from, from the statement that he delivered in 1951 at the, IS, the International Statistical Institute's conference, uh, he, he said, we are of the opinion that the theories, methods, and systems in connection with statistics adopted in a country cannot but be closely linked with the social system of the country in question. And I'll, I'll, uh, in, a little later in the talk, I'll, I'll sort of give you a, a clearer sense of what is underlying this kind of sort of very strong distinction that is being drawn between uh, uh, the system of governance, uh, in, in effect, the political and ideological system of governance and its relationship to, to statistics. But you can see the clues of it already very clearly in the early 1950s. And this uh, sort of um, uh, distinction uh, persists through uh, the, the subsequent years. And my sense is things don't really change until uh, the summer of 1956 when um, an Indian Planning Commission delegation visits China. This is a delegation that's led by Pitambar Pant. Uh, they spend over a month uh, and deliver a whole range of lectures, including at the State Statistics Bureau in Beijing, where they talk about what is going on in the world of statistics and planning in India. So that, I think, provides Chinese statisticians the first sense after 1951, uh, first sort of concrete sense of, of what, is, uh, what is going on. So in some ways, when Joan Lai went to, went to the ISI in December of 1956, he probably had been briefed to some extent that there is something interesting worth, uh, worth looking into. Um, and <clears throat> within, within, uh, within sort of weeks of Joan Lai's departure, actually, a four-person delegation led by Wang Sehua, who's the gentleman in the photograph uh, reading, uh, reading from the piece of paper, uh, and, and a, a deputy director of the, uh, of the uh, State Statistics Bureau in, in, in China, 
he leads this four member delegation. They're ostensibly in Calcutta to participate in the 25th anniversary of the founding of the Indian Statistical Institute, but they end up staying a month. They end up staying a month and they uh, do a whole range of research and, and try and sort of understand what the ISI has been doing, what kinds of statistical work they've been doing, and in particular learning about the, the large scale random sampling surveys, NSS, but other kinds of things that the ISI has been, has been running. Um, they return uh, in January of 1957, and by March itself, uh, Wang Sahua is publishing in Statistical Work, the main statistical journal of the PRC at this time, enthusiastically promoting the adoption of random uh, sample surveys, randomized uh, sample surveys. Uh, at the same time, uh, Wang Sahua meets with his boss, Shui Mu Chiao, and with other senior political leaders, and they begin discussions on uh, inviting Malanobis to Beijing to continue the discussions that have been begun. That have, that have begun. Uh, this visit does indeed take place uh, in uh, the summer of 1957, June to July of 1957. Malanobis spends about 21 days in Beijing. He is accompanied by the statistician D.B. Lahiri, who you can see is the, is the bespectacled gentleman to Malanobis's right. Malanobis is in the middle of a photograph in front of the double doors. And there are, you know, you can see some of the other people here. Zhou Enlai is, is here. Uh, Malanobis's wife is there. Uh, Deng Yingchao, Zhou Enlai's wife, is also here. Uh, and then the two gentlemen on the extreme right of the photograph are Wang Sefa and Shui Mu Chiao. And so this is sort of a dinner to mark the end of the visit in some ways. Uh, but what both Malinobis and Bibi Lahiri do uh, is deliver a range of lectures, participate in group discussions. Uh, it's a very hectic schedule uh, and uh, they focus on a range of areas that include, uh, that not include so much as focus on in particular mathematical statistics uh, and random sampling. And a lot of these materials are then compiled and actually published by the State Statistics Bureau in 1958 as a book uh, meant for wider dissemination. If I remember correctly, it has a print run of about, about, about 5,000 or 6,000. So not a huge print run, but not an insignificant one uh, either. Uh, so just as, a, as a, a quick reminder, some of the people I've spoken of so far, uh, Wang Sofwa, the Deputy Director of the State Stats Bureau, who leads the delegation to India, who plays a pivotal role in inviting Malanobis, who's at the bottom there. Uh, and then Shui Mu Chiao, who was Wang Sehua's boss, he was the director of the State Stats Bureau in the 1950s, and who, someone who goes on to play actually a very important role in the post-1978 reforms in China, because he's one of the economists deeply involved in some of the price reforms and the, and, and the, the market and enterprise reforms uh, that, that go on. So, so uh, these are sort of some of the main dramatis uh, personae in some ways. Um, maybe I should add one or two other details. Wang Sehua is also interesting because he actually is, I think, well, according to his own biography, the first uh, person to translate uh, Marx's Das Kapital into Chinese or, 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 or large parts of it. And this was as late as the 19, early 1930s. <clears throat> I won't, for this audience, I won't belabor um, sort of um, a, a PC Malinobis's introduction. I mean, I think everyone here is quite familiar with, with who he is and the role he played, including the, the kind of seminal role he has played, but also how controversial a figure he is now in the history of Indian, Indian planning. So uh, after Malanobis's return, the, the uh, return to, to Calcutta in, in uh, July of 1957, these exchanges sort of uh, uh, discussions over these exchanges continue. And in 1958, two young Chinese statisticians by the name of Wu Hui and Gong Jianyao spend an entire year at the Indian Statistical Institute. Uh, and again, their primary purpose is to study uh, large scale random sampling, but they also go on field trips where they participate in the actual sampling exercises, they join teams, the sampling teams, and so on. Uh, and then, of course, both of these figures, who I was fortunate enough to interview in 2010 and 2011, uh, go on to play important roles in post-78 uh, statistical reform as well. Uh, so, uh, so this is in 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 very brief sort of the uh, uh, the narrative of the exchanges as they play out from the, the during the second half of the 1950s. Uh, I want to return. Uh, briefly to, to what I'd said about the early 1950s and sort of the Chao Bai statement about rejecting in some ways anything to do with India uh, and, and, and why that might be. Um, so uh, Li Fuchun, uh, another very important figure in the history of, of sort of economic planning in, in China, uh, provides us a slightly better sense of what the thinking at that time was. So this is also a statement delivered in 1951 where uh, to quote him, he says, in the past, China was a semi-colonial, semi-feudal country. Strictly speaking, it did not possess any statistics worth speaking of. Statistics in old China was learned from the Anglo-American bourgeoisie. This kind of statistics cannot serve as our weapon. It is unsuitable for the tasks of managing and supervising the country. We need to build 
a new statistics for uh, a new China. So what you see here in some ways is a very strong articulation of a particular definition of statistics, a definition that is tying it to uh, the nature of, uh, uh, of, of sort of uh, uh, the, the nature of the politics in the country, uh, but also the nature of, uh, of sort of um, um, uh, the nature of society in, 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 in that country. Um, in order to in order to sort of understand though what the roots of this might be, and I think there is there is uh, if we just read this uh, at surface level, it can be like oh well this is just a cold war and and sort of an allegiance to a particular kind of socialist or a particular kind of uh, anti uh, sort of bourgeois anti capitalist mode of uh, of uh, thinking about statistics. But as I discovered, there is actually a deep lying theoretical engagement with a question about what statistics ought to be. In order to understand where the, what what that slightly deeper definitional sort of debate is, and what the what the final definition of statistics, as it was adopted in the 1950s in China, is, I want to take a quick step back and offer to you sort of what are essentially one can say three modes of counting. I think these were the three modes of counting that were available to Chinese statisticians in the 1950s. Well, arguably, these are the three modes of counting that are available to us today in some ways too. Um, so let me let me sort of briefly describe them for you. Um, so the first mode, and these, I use this terminology in the book as well, the first mode is really the ethnographic mode, which, as you can imagine, really uh, requires the individual researcher or the, the, the surveyor to personally be present in the phenomena that he or she is surveying, right? So your personal ability to observe, to record, to interact with the subjects of the research are absolutely central to any kind of authority you can claim about knowing that particular subject. So this is the classic anthropological method. It's classic. Um, it's a, it's a classic method that's used in the various other social sciences also. It's fundamentally qualitative, uh, and it really, in the end, depends on not so much uh, the the quality of the sample that you survey, but also the quality of the researcher himself or herself. So this is one mode, the ethnographic mode, and this uh, had a had a history in in China already in the early 1950s because one of the most seminal tracts within the history of Maoist theory, uh, Mao's 1927 report uh, on uh, an investigation of the peasant movement in Hunan, uh, which is fundamentally an ethnographic kind of exercise that spoke of this sort of, you know, the, the, the coming peasant revolution in some ways that was, that, that, was, uh, that recognized the potential of the peasants. Uh, this, it, was, it was a perfect example of this. And actually in the late, uh, late 1950s and early in, in 1960, this particular report would become, would be, uh, would be raised up as sort of the prototypical example of a particular mode of doing social survey research. So the ethnographic is one mode that's very much present in the 1950s. Uh, the other mode that's, that's uh, present is, is the exhaustive, which again, as the name suggests, basically says, well, if you want to know something, a, a social phenomenon, the only way to know it is to go out and count it exhaustively. You have to count every instance of whatever it is that you're interested in counting. Put simply, this is the census method, right? So this is what happens every 10 years in India. It happens every 10 years in China, in the US. Um, but the idea really is that uh, you cannot, the, the only way to count something is to count it, to, to perform a complete count, not to do a partial count, not to do a, a kind of ethnographic kind of survey, but to count exhaustively. Um, the third method that's, uh, that is becoming extremely powerful in the 1950s, to some extent, thanks to uh, the kinds of activities that uh, the Indian Statistical Institute has been undertaking since the 1930s, is what I label stochastic, uh, which really is relying upon um, probability theory and mathematical statistics to essentially devise ways to carry out sampling, but carry it out in a randomized way. And the idea really is that you can, instead of doing something that's exhaustive, which is extremely ex expensive, ex extremely time consuming, or something that is, uh, that is uh, ethnographic and therefore easily biased, biased both in terms of the selection of the sample and also the, uh, because of the biases of the, uh, of the surveyor, the, the stochastic essentially promises by randomizing, it promises to take away those problems. So it says this is a cheaper way, it's a faster way, it's a more accurate way to determine a social reality. Now, I don't want to say that this is, it solves all problems. It comes with, it comes with its own sort of baggage in many ways, but it's a nice way to think about uh, the stochastic as a response to the problems generated by both the exhaustive uh, and the, the ethnographic uh, modes. Now, what's interesting in the 1950s, especially in the early 1950s, is that it is the exhaustive mode that dominates in China, and hence the, the sort of large, larger font that I've used here. And it, and it dominates not, not because, uh, uh, it, it dominates for a, for a very specific set of essentially uh, theoretical reasons. Um, 
And uh, to understand this, I think we need to sort of recognize uh, to the, the, the extent to which uh, the Soviet Union had a huge influence to play uh, in, uh, in China and the ways in which there was a particular reading of Marxist teleological progress, the fact that you know, we know how history is going to unfold, in particular, how human history is going to unfold. We know that we are all going to end up in a, a communist utopia through, uh, you know, through a detour by, in, in socialism. Um, therefore, uh, they, they sort of use that particular, one could argue, reductive reading of, of, of Marxist theology to essentially say uh, there should be no place for randomness, for chance, for uncertainty when it comes to analyzing the social world. So they drew this strong distinction basically to say that statistics cannot apply in the same way to the natural world and the social world. These are two fundamentally different things and they need to be understood differently. So out of this sort of, uh, I can, I'm happy to elaborate on this in Q&A later on, but, but uh, as, as a result of drawing this distinction, uh, they moved away from thinking of statistics as a universal science that can be applied uh, to both the natural and social order and instead said, well, uh, the natural order is fine, randomness, chance, uncertainty can operate there, but when it comes to looking at society uh, and, and the social world, then there are other sets of laws. So there are class relations, there are the laws of uh, the relations of production, things like that, those are important, but there's no uncertainty and no chance to deal with here. So once you make that distinction, then you can be fairly internally coherent as you go through what the next sort of, what the, what the path dependency of that will produce. Uh, and what it produces is essentially a total rejection of all kinds of probabilistic methods, and instead the adoption of uh, what are uh, exhaustive methods, the census method or other kinds of exhaustive enumeration. So this is a table where I try and sort of summarize these distinctions. It's drawn from the book. As you can see, once you make that distinction between statistics as a social science and not a natural science or a universal science, you end up essentially with methods that reject the law of large numbers, reject probability theory, reject uh, concepts like variation, correlation, regression, sort of the bedrock of modern statistics in some ways, and of course, random sampling, and favor in turn uh, exhaustive enumeration, periodic reports, and, and typical uh, sampling. So, so this is sort of the situation as it obtains in the early 1950s, uh, and it leads to then a very particular kind of statistical apparatus. Uh, to give you again a very brief sense uh, what this means, as, as I've said, it means an, a reliance on, on, on the exhaustive method uh, and they, they approach this essentially by devising uh, what in Chinese translates into the complete enumeration statistical periodical report system, which is essentially a, a system of periodic reports that all units within uh, society and economy have to file. These can be annual, monthly, six monthly, seasonal, uh, and so on. Uh, and then there are some instances where they don't, when you can't use the periodic reports, that, you, that they also rely upon, upon censuses, so one-time censuses of, uh, say, a census of a particular kind of industry. Uh, and, and so on. Um, given sort of the, the predominance of complete enumeration and the complete enumeration, enumeration statistical periodical report system, there is some space created uh, for other modes of, of, uh, of research. These are mostly in the ethnographic mode, uh, which are in the, in the bottom half of the slides, sort of things like uh, non-stochastic survey sampling, you have typical sampling, quota sampling, scope of sampling. These are, these are again used, these are fundamentally sort of um, qualitative in nature and not, not randomized in any way. So you have these, these kinds of methods that become, that, that are privileged through the early 1950s, and it leads to essentially building a vast statistical infrastructure. Uh, at the top, you have the Stats Bureau in Beijing, the State Stats Bureau in Beijing. And then from there, you have sort of in this nice pyram pyramidical structure, you have provincial bureaus, county level offices, and village cooperatives. And you can get a sense of the numbers here, about 2,200 county level offices, and then village cooperatives that number by about 55, 1955-56 at about 750,000. Uh, and of course, by about this time, by 1956, uh, uh, the Stats Bureau is also claiming that they have about 200,000 full-time statistical cadre at work. Of course, the number of part-time cadres is, is, is uh, you know, you, once you add that, it's a, it's a much, much higher number of people who are engaged in statistical work. So, so you, you see built a very different kind of system than, uh, what, uh, than one that might exist in other countries. Uh, it's, it's, as I said, it's modeled very much on the Soviet Union at this time. Uh, and it's one of the things that in 1957, when P.C. Malinovis uh, and D.B. Lahiri are, are in conversation with, with Chinese statisticians, they're actually deeply impressed by what they see because they, they remark that we cannot even imagine being able to set something up like this in India. 
um, which, which I thought was very interesting sort of reflection on perhaps the logics of moving so aggressively towards random sampling in India so early. I want to uh, stress two other key principles that guided planning and economic activity during this time that had a huge implication then for uh, statistical work. The first of these is, is this was a question of economic policy uh, where material production uh, and, 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 and a way of understanding or economic accounting that, that privileged material production over services. Uh, and uh, this, this uh, can be most easily re recognized uh, through the standard mode of accounting that existed in the PRC at this time and indeed into the, into the late 1980s, uh, which is known as the material product system that only counts physical objects that are produced and doesn't really take into account a range of services. Um, the other system of accounting, would be, uh, which is the, the UN system known as the system of national accounts, did this from a very early, uh, early point itself. Uh, but you can see that uh, it leads to certain kinds of imbalances when you only focus on material objects that are being produced to the neglect of services, then something like statistics, which is fundamentally a service, can be potentially neglected in the overall scheme of things. Um, the second uh, guiding principle that was hugely significant uh, for, for the operation of statistics was the balance between uh, industry and agriculture. Given uh, the, the nature of sort of um, economic planning in the 1950s, there was a tremendous focus on trying to industrialize China as quickly as possible. The approach actually very similar to the approach taken by Marlon Obis in his second five-year plan was to focus on heavy industries uh, and, and, and sort of try and match, uh, uh, in the greatly forward at least, the, 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 the slogan was to match, uh, match the, surpass the UK and match the US in steel production and so on. Uh, but this meant that there was a relative neglect of agriculture and agriculture was only seen as a source of surplus that could be used for investment into industry. Um, again, given uh, in a country that is still largely agrarian, in 1949, uh, agriculture was about 50% of the, uh, the economy in terms of value, and of course, much, much larger in terms of, if you think of labor. Um, this this uh, skew, again, has interesting implications because the industry, industrial sector is actually much easier to enumerate if you're looking at exhaustive enumeration, as opposed to the, 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 the countryside, which is much more diverse um, and, 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 and uh, sort of um, um, uh, dispersed. Um, so um, as you can imagine, when you combine sort of these principles with uh, an overt emphasis on uh, exhaustive enumeration, the create, creation of periodical reports, what happens by 1955 and 1956 is that they're confronting, Chinese statisticians are confronting a whole range of problems. Um, so or this is a quick aside maybe, before I get to the problems, I can, I can talk about this very briefly. So one of the consequences of this material production being privileged over services is really, by, again, by the mid-decade, mid a, a real crisis of morale because statisticians, statistical workers at the ground level are constantly being uh, essentially told that the work they're doing is worthless because it's the, it's the people in the, in the factories and in the fields uh, that are really producing for, for China and not so much the, the statistician. So you have a, a massive campaign is mounted uh, essentially to promote statistical work. And as part of the campaign, one of the people who are writing uh, what is essentially a propaganda piece states, every time I complete a statistical table, my happiness is like that of a peasant on his field catching sight of a golden ear of wheat. My excitement like that of a steel worker observing molten, molten steel emerging from a Martin furnace and my elation like that of an artist com completing a beautiful painting. Right, so there's an attempt to actually equate the table that a statistical worker produces as part of this, uh, the periodical report system as being the same as a tangible material object produced for the economy, such as steel, such as wheat, uh, and indeed even, even, even artistic goods. Uh, so, so there are attempts to sort of address these questions of, of, of morale as well that are generated by these problems. But on the flip side, a response to this kind of encouragement to produce tables is a whole range of problems the, the most glaring of which really is the overproduction of data. So in a perverse way, you have set up a system that ends up uh, uh, incentivizing the production of tables. And by, again, the mid-decade, you see uh, internal memoranda full of complaints about the overproduction of data. Uh, they are produced in a chaotic way. They are produced uh, in excess. Uh, and then tied to this overproduction, you very quickly see other kinds of issues that emerge. You have uh, a problems of incommensurability. Uh, this is sort of whether it's about the units of measurement that are being used, uh, whether it's uh, about um, you know how how are certain units being classified, you know whether this is a, sm a small scale industry or a medium scale industry, things like that. 
uh, and then incommensurability and of course overproduction of data very quickly uh, result in chronic delays. So you have statements like, uh, you know, much of the data that's been produced is useless at the moment of creation. We can we can uh, we can uh, produce them and discard them pretty much at the same time because they're so worthless. So in some ways, uh, I'm, I'm glossing this over in the interest of time, but you have sort of a whole range of problems that emerge. Uh, in some ways, I encapsulate this in what I'm calling sort of data zone uncertainty principle, where you start seeing very clearly by 56, 57, a recognition that accuracy and timeliness uh, are, are in real tension here. Uh, when you stress accuracy, timeliness goes for a six. Uh, if you want things to be timely, then accuracy is going to be compromised. Precision is going to be compromised. And in some ways, uh, what's, what's interesting is that uh, it's in 1957 that Shermu Chiao actually tries to resolve this debate. So this is, again, the, the, I began with the story of what's going on with the China-India exchanges. And I think uh, what I want to stress is that it's these kinds of tensions, these kinds of problems, I think, that make the exchanges with India that make the interest in random sampling uh, comprehensible to us today, given the very strong ideological differences, the theoretical differences that had been articulated earlier in the decade. But in 1957, Shermu Chiao finally tries to break the impasse between this sort of accuracy and timeliness problem. And he says, in order for the leading authorities to understand the situation, research questions, and decide on policies, they frequently need reference data on a timelier basis. Such data need not possess a high degree of accuracy or be comprehensive, but it must be supplied in a timely fashion. So in some ways now you, what you have is, uh, is, is, a, is sanctioned from the very top to produce estimates. And starting in 57, and this problem becomes especially acute during the greatly forward that follows, you essentially have um, a, a tremendous amount of estimation that goes on that further undermines the quality of, of statistical data that is being produced in the PRC uh, in, in the late 1950s. Um, I, won't, uh, uh, I won't sort of um, uh, speak much about this. Again, if there's interest uh, in the q and I can, I can certainly talk about it. But in the book, I end the story with what happens to statistics in the Great Leap Forward, uh, which is the, you know, starts in 1958, uh, as many of you know, and, and sort of map out how in some ways what we see is a continuation of many of the debates that I've, I've sort of uh, faced for you uh, this morning. Uh, but most, most specifically, what happens is that uh, the exhaustive method itself gets rejected, not in favor of the stochastic method, which, of course, there has been a, an engagement with uh, in, from 56 to 58, but in favor of the ethnographic method. And, and to go back to, as I said, 1927 and to Mao's report on the peasant movement in Hunan, and that gets elevated and, 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 and sort of this fundamentally ethnographic, fundamentally personalized, individualized mode of doing social uh, scientific research gets uh, gets um, elevated to sort of uh, uh, theory in some ways. That that is part of the story of the Great Leap Forward, and in some ways, I, I argue, helps us understand uh, the statistical catastrophe that also is part of the story of the, the Great Leap Forward and and the famine. Uh, but again, as I said, uh, in the interest of time, I know I've already gone over thirty minutes. I won't I won't sort of speak more about that now. Uh, I want to just end uh, with a few uh, sort of uh, reminders of how, you know, why the story is, I think, interesting or significant, the different registers that, uh, that one can read the story through. Uh, the first, of course, is, is to look at sort of statistics and planning within China, the history of the PRC itself. Um, and one of the sort of insights, that broad, broader insights that emerges really is that there is a copious production of facts in the 1950s in China, but the state and the state's functionaries remain poorly informed nonetheless. Um, and, and it's an interesting way to think about then uh, how data gets produced and what the past dependencies are to the production of data and then to the use of data. And this has implications, I think, also for the second point here, which is how we think about uh, questions of manipulation. And this is, of course, as again, those of you who follow China know, it's, this is a constant refrain that can we trust statistics that are produced by the Chinese state. Uh, and I think there's a lot of good research that shows us what is reliable, where the problems are, and so on. Uh, I think the case of 1950s and the story that I've, I've related to you and what I uh, explore in the book, I think helps us recognize uh, a, a second way in which I think data can be biased and can be manipulated. And it doesn't really have to do with uh, manipulations that are at the, at the sort of at the end of the process, which you can think of as post hoc kinds of, uh, kinds of manipulation, which is often the kinds of manipulation that we do see, you know, with GDP figures. And this is, of course, a lively topic in, in recent Indian economic history also, right, with the ways in which, uh, which some of the 
the methods to calculate GDP were changed, which changed the overall GDP out, um, uh, outcome itself and so on. But these are all done sort of seem to be done post hoc. Once the number is produced, it seemed to be politically or otherwise um, um, uh, unfavorable. And so data has to be massaged. What I'm arguing for is the kinds of sort of theoretical debates, the kinds of theoretical distinction, distinctions that get made that then influence the adoption of certain techniques, certain methods over other methods that then generate path dependencies. So the fact that you had a significant amount of estimation, the fact that you could not get reliable data had a lot to do with these earlier theoretical debates that had to do with the nature of statistics itself and not about post hoc manipulation either. So I think un uncovering sort of the, the sort of getting in the weeds in some ways is just as important as trying to focus on post hoc manipulation, I think. Uh, then very briefly, I think one of the things I want to stress is uh, that the 1950s is a very interesting moment in the history of data because what we see is universal enthusiasm for data and the power of data to fundamentally transform um, all aspects of life. And this, this rings true both in the socialist world as well as in the what you, may, what you may call the liberal bourgeois capitalist world and in other places that are not so easily um, um, not so easily uh, sort of uh, um, um, classifiable. Uh, what's interesting though, is that even though there is a tremendous degree of enthusiasm and confidence that data can solve all our, all our problems, the ways in which that enthusiasm manifests itself in terms of the methods that are used are actually quite at odds with each other. And so this example of, of statistics in China is, is one of them where you see a very strong uh, theoretical distinction made that then leads to uh, leads to very different outcomes, and in some ways, this is a reminder that we should not assume, which is one of sort of the givens in the in the broader history of data that speaks to basically the rise of probabilistic thinking, the rise of sort of getting, or the the fact that we as human beings have become comfortable with questions of chance. That was seen to be a, a process that had already unfolded in the late 19th, early 20th century. The case of the 1950s with China and the Soviet Union, by extension, reminds us that that really is not the case. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, on Cold War sort of scientific networks, I think this is some this is work that I'm continuing to do in some ways. Uh, it's just recognizing that so much of our sense of Cold War science is informed by essentially a framework that recognizes either the US and, and sort of the, the uh, Western Europe can be included in that, and, and the Soviet Union as these two nodes from which all cutting edge science uh, emanates, and then everywhere else, basically, they are, are, are recipients of this cutting edge science. Either they're applying it, adapting it, but they're not really producing uh, cutting edge science. And I think that that to, in many cases, that's of course true. I mean, these are major centers of scientific innovation and research, uh, but I think there are other instances like the case of statistics in the 1950s with, between China and India. And I would argue many other instances that one can find uh, where I think we can complicate the story and look at other ways in which other kinds of scientific exchanges were taking place uh, that can move us away from this fairly reductive, reductive model. Uh, I'm going to stop here because I've gone way over time already, uh, and but we can maybe talk about the contemporary relevance uh, in Q&A if it comes up and if there's interest. But thank you so much for listening, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Arunab. That was really, uh, you know, uh, tour de force. It was really a wide-ranging discussion. Um, I'm not even going to attempt to, no, there's no need to sum it up. Uh, you didn't go beyond time at all, so... Thank you for that. And uh, before I, you know, raise it to the, leave, open it to the audience, I just wanted to ask you about your sources for this uh, subject. What were your main sources which you used and how difficult was it to access them? Yeah, so this is this is uh, an, an increasingly important question, unfortunately, given, uh, given the changing nature of access uh, in the PRC right now. So uh, the, the vast bulk of my material uh, is uh, sort of material produced by the State Statistical Bureau and it's various uh, from various levels. So from the, the, the level of the, the Bureau in Beijing itself down to provincial and local and sometimes county level materials. Uh, and uh, I was able to get these uh, from the Beijing Municipal Archives primarily. Uh, my original plan had been to actually go to multiple archives in multiple provinces, but in the Beijing Municipal Archives itself, I found an amazingly rich collection because Beijing being the capital uh, and then the municipal government being heavily involved in a lot of these meetings ended up collecting a lot of material from other provinces. So I was able to actually consult material from a range of other provinces without having to, to travel there. So that in some ways, I ended up doing almost eight, eight or nine months of uh, sort of archival work 
uh, in in the Beijing Municipal Archives. So that was sort of archivally the, in in China the core uh, the core of my my material uh, my source base. But I did an extensive amount of work also in uh, in a range of libraries because the advantage with working on the 1950s and working on, on, on in a you know on a, on a technical field. Uh, is that there are a lot of publications, formal and semi-formal uh, publications. So these I could collect in libraries. So I did a lot of work. I was affiliated with uh, uh, at Tsinghua University in Beijing. So I used, uh, because of the access I had to their library, I used a tremendous amount of materials from there. Uh, but then also other libraries all over Beijing at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences uh, and so on. And then the third major area, uh, ma important source was actually being able to conduct a, a handful of oral history interviews. Uh, with with some of these practitioners, including the two that I mentioned very briefly in my presentation, uh, Wu Hui and Gong Jianyao, uh, who both very kindly agreed to talk to me and and gave me in some ways both gave me a sense of what their experience and memories were, but also helped me help, help confirm some of the broader conclusions that I was arriving at myself in terms of what happened at that time. So those would be uh, on the China side uh, uh, would would be the the main areas, uh, main sources, uh, main main sites where I, where I uh, collected sources in, in India. As you can imagine, the the archives of the Indian Statistical Institute were hugely important, uh, and and uh, they had just begun digitizing at that time. Uh, so so it was an interesting moment to be there. Uh, but then also the National Archives in India, and uh, and again libraries and so on. So th that would be sort of uh, the broad broad. Uh, um, Sort of types of sources and and and, and um, institutions where I where I was able to get them, uh, and just as a final point, I think we we discussed this before the the session began. Uh, given that the archival situation in China is so different, I think uh, we all recognize those of us who are publishing books now. I've been speaking to other friends and colleagues. We all recognize how lucky we were because we actually did our research at a time of relative openness. It was sort of the la it was the end of a period of openness. Uh, and I think it's very difficult to do this. I don't think if I were to do this project now, the book I'd be able to write would be very, very different because I don't think I'd have access to the kinds of materials I had. And I, I, I should, I'm sorry, I didn't mention this. And one major source, which is now completely off, off limits was actually the foreign ministry archives. So I found amazing materials in the foreign ministry archives about Malanobis' visit to the PRC. In particular, I found essentially a, uh, a 15, uh, a, 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 a journal of his uh, almost like a daily account of his activities um, that was produced with about 75, 80 pages. So gave a very detailed textured kind of uh, description of what both Malinobis and Laidi did, who they went, where they went, who they talked to, um, and uh, and also, you know, some some actual dialogue, right? So the remarks they were making and so on, that, that really adds color to what can otherwise seem to be a very sort of staid, uh, state exercise. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll, uh, I think I'll call on uh, Dr. Prabir Chakravarti first. He had raised his hand. Please go ahead, unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hampi. I hope I can be heard by Oruno. Yes, please uh, go see. ahead. I have a very simple question, Oruno. A simple question to you, Oruno. Mm -hmm. uh, I I think I met you about eight years ago, eight or nine years ago at the ICS. And I want to say the biggest mistake which I feel China has done is they went in for the one child policy, which according to me has led to a big issue in 2015. They have made it two children. And now they today, a few days back, it got to three children. So the net result is we are finding even in the PLA and other people, all the old people are back again something like a situation in Japan. How, how did such a big statistical mistake take place? You said they have used the theory of probability, random sampling. I have been dealing with statistics because my artillery downs are all pure statistics. Warfare is pure statistics, you know. Mm -hmm. so you take a sample and you expect that you follow the Gaussian curve. How did such a big mistake take place? I'm sure you went to all the archives. How did is was it a political mistake? Was it a statistical mistake? How do you actually possibly so, so we will is, win only due to this? <laughs> so this is this is a, a really interesting and very important question. And as, as you rightly point out, it's become uh, very important again in light of the the latest sort of announcement that now the state wants that is allowing uh, Chinese families uh, to have up to three children. Uh, I don't uh, I don't look at the one child policy in my own work it's it's something that emerges later you know it's 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 a policy that gets enacted in 1979 sort of and really comes into effect in the 1980s uh, but some of the issues that i deal with 
are, are very much a part of that story, right? How do we think about science and how, how do we think about politics? How do we think about um, how, how these things come together and at times influence each other? Uh, the case of statistics in the 1950s, I think, is an example of this. And it's not simply to say something gets politicized. I think everything is political in a certain way. The question becomes, how exactly is the politics influencing the science? And to what extent, extent do we think of science as having autonomy? How is that autonomy even understood in various contexts? I mean, you can ask these questions as STS scholars do for, for science in, in the US and you know, with all the research on COVID right now that's going on in the US as well. Uh, but on the specific question of the one child policy, there is actually a fantastic book that does look into this precise question you're asking and try to, tries to uncover or answer how did this happen? Um, and the book is, is called Just One Child by Susan Greenhall. If you haven't read it, I would highly recommend reading it. And what she discovers, uh, and she did sort of, like, she, uh, she was at the Population Council through the 1980s, uh, and then became uh, a professor later on. So she had extensive connections, networks in China because you know colleagues, people she had interviewed, and through them she was able to go and interview a lot of the people who were involved in the debate in the late 70s that then ended up in sort of uh, the one child policy. And one of the things she found, or, or one of the, the main arguments she makes is that you had three, uh, three sort of communities that were involved in this debate. One community was Marxist uh, theorists, right? So party theorists uh, from within uh, within the establishment. The second group uh, was demographers. And these were demographers, I think, primarily based at People's University, Ren Renmin University uh, in, in Beijing. And Renmin University is interesting because, of course, it was set up in the late 40s as the, the cadre training school, but it was also the place that established the first uh, 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 department of demography. Uh, in the 1950s, right? So it had a whole, whole history, a long history of doing demographic research. So this was the second group. These were specialist demographers in some ways. And the third group was a bunch of rocket scientists, rocket scientists who had gained a tremendous amount of prestige within that particular moment. Again, recall 1977, 78 is a particular moment where Deng Xiaoping is on uh, sort of on the ascendancy and he is on the ascendancy. Uh, uh, he, he's partly hoping to promote a particular more technocratic approach to governance, sort of hearkening back to perhaps uh, Liu Xiaoqi and Zhou Enlai and, 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 and something that had been experimented with in the 50s. And central to that is privileging science and technology. Uh, so it's at a moment where science and technology is, the leadership is partic particularly uh, receptive to science and technology and to scientists and engineers, but also this group of scientists who are essentially uh, missile scientists, uh, people who have contributed tremendously to China's sense of national security by producing all these long range ICBMs, they end up becoming a very powerful force in this debate because what they are able to do is precisely produce extremely persuasive because they are sophisticated mathematical models of what future trajectories of China's population might look like. And through that, they're able to argue that none of the other methods that are being proposed are going to be uh, go going to work. The only way we can actually achieve that China can survive is by implementing the one child policy. So you see a combination of sophisticated mathematical modeling, the kind of privilege that a particular moment grants a certain set of scientists over actually domain experts, over demographers, who actually would have said, no, we should not proceed with this, or even indeed party theoreticians. So you see a particular moment and it generates a certain set of outcomes. And you can, yes, you can certainly argue that the one child policy was actually quite unnecessary because if you go back and look at the data, the population growth had already begun to slow in China. And uh, as you know, so many development economists, uh, Amartya Sen and so many others have shown that it's other factors that really uh, have a much larger bearing on, the, on family size, right? And nothing is more important than actually um, the, the education levels of the mother, of the mother to be, right? Uh, so, and that actually had already been happening since the early seventies. There was a, a, a policy that was instituted in the early seventies, I think it was called uh, longer, later, and fewer, or something like that, or more further apart. I forget the exact slogan now. Uh, and that had already slowed uh, the, the TFR in China by the late 1970s. But of course, they didn't do that. So I think if you if you read the book, I think you'll get a really good sense of, of how these kinds of things can they emerge, and then the problems they generate. It's it's interesting to see how this will play out in China now, because one of the interesting things was that they were well aware in 1970 and 80 that this is going to be a problem down the road. So. One of the ironies is that one of the earliest places in the world where you see dedicated centers for the study of ge for gerontology, the study of aging, were also established in China in anticipation in some ways of this problem. 
so, uh, so, I mean, it, it is a huge challenge. Uh, I mean, how, how they deal with it, I think, uh, remains to be seen. But, uh, but maybe I should stop there and, and, and take other questions too. But thank you. This is obviously a hugely important question. Um, there are several questions in the chat box. So I think I'll take them one, uh, one by one uh, first. Uh, the first is from Alok Singh, who says, do you have any comment that uh, China is ahead in applied science slash technology, but lag lagging in original pure science uh, knowledge? Do you have yeah, so, so yeah, this is this is again a very important question. Um, I don't have as much of a sense of what the exact uh, situation now is. My sense is there's a lot of there's a lot of emphasis being placed on on pure research also right now. There is a recognition that that's it's hugely important. I think the the broader issue, of course, is that in the past few years there has been a significant clampdown on intellectual and academic freedom writ large, and and some of the you know so that, that's a that's a broader question that I think remains unanswered in some ways. Can you see um, uh, really innovative research take place? In, in extremely politicized, not politicized so much as extremely controlled, controlled environments. And again, here the history of, of science in, in um, earlier in the PRC, but also in the Soviet Union is instructive. And what you see is actually a very, uh, an interesting kind of spectrum emerges of where the state intervenes in, in science and what domains of science and pure science are, are uh, significantly, um, uh, where attempts to control it are made significantly and other domains that are left alone. Uh, and uh, just to, 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 to continue with, uh, in the vein of Professor uh, Chakraborty's question, uh, missile scientists or people engaged in nuclear research in most contexts tend to enjoy the greatest amount of freedom because that is somehow seen to be part of national security and so on. So they are not interfered with. The sciences that typically get to get are interfered with the most tend to be the biological sciences. And we are in some ways in the midst of seeing that globally today, right? The implications of that globally today. Um, and you know you see it in the 50s with Lysenkoism. You see it today with the kinds of controversies that are going on with COVID-19, including uh, you know the how COVID-19, what what the origins of COVID-19 are, and you know it's 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 turning out to be a fairly messy story where it seems like um, you know we don't know and we won't know because access won't be made available. Uh, but in some ways, it's showing how interconnected this kind of scientific research is. It's not about it's not nationally confined in many ways, as you know. Uh, uh, you know, the one, one of the areas in which there's so much uh, interest now is what was going on at the Wuhan Institute for Virology. And, um, and it seems that there was massive US investment in some of that research. So it's not, it, these nation state categories become, become much more complicated. So my sense is that I think uh, there, is, there is a tremendous amount of in investment and, and recognition that pure science is important, but it's unclear to me how given the much, much stronger amount of, I think, uh, control over intellectual and academic life in China today, whether that's going to significantly stymie uh, real real innovation and real progress. That remains to be seen, I think. Okay, uh, we have a question from Neeraj Singh Manhas, to, which is that, uh, is China still using the ethnographic mode of counting? And isn't this data manipulated? In your opinion, what will be the best way for the Indian I India's ISI to collect statistics in the future? Oh well, lots of lots of very big questions, uh, or at least the second set of questions are are, are really big ones. So, uh, I mean, I think the important thing to remember is that, uh, and the fifties, the, uh, the story of the fifties is, is a very good example or, or provides a good lesson for this, is that I think overt reliance on any one of these three methods is probably not the way to go. I think the way to proceed is to recognize that each of these three methods brings uh, certain things of value to the table, and we really need to understand what it is that we need to know, you know what, is, what is the question we're asking, what is the object of our research, and then what is the best method to try and, try and ascertain um, uh, that, that knowledge. So in some contexts, I think the ethnographic method remains hugely important and we cannot neglect it. But in other methods, of, in other, other areas, it's a census method that might be very applicable. And of course, in, in, in finally, random sampling, large scale random sampling, which of course, as anyone who does uh, any kind of research in the sciences or in the social sciences knows, is really the bedrock of so much of research now. So I think recognizing this balance, that there's, there's a balance that needs to be achieved is important. I think it's especially important today because we are in a moment where uh, we see this tremendous enthusiasm for big data and sort of big data methods of, which in many ways echo this moment, this kind of exhaustive enumeration approach, right? That there is all this data that we can collect. And if we have data at scale, then we can answer all kinds of questions. And in some ways, I think this, it represents a similar kind of, I think, uh, misrecognition in some ways or, or over-reliance on a particular method 
to try and to try and push for answers. And again, I, I'm happy to go into what what sort of the other problems there might be with sort of an over reliance on big data at the expense of more traditional kinds of kinds of approaches. Um, so so, but the short answer is that I think it's it's present, but of course you don't see you don't see this kind of theoretical debate in China anymore that you did see in the 1950s. Um, uh, and, and you're right, ethnographic data can be much more easily manipulated. That remains the big challenge. Uh, and, but the irony, of course, is that if you have a good, uh, if, the, if the scholar is, is good in quotes, good as in, you know, conscientious and honest and, and so on, then it can produce valuable insights also. And, and, the, and, a, and a telling example actually comes from uh, the case of China, again, in some ways, comes from the Great Leap Forward, because it is actually Liu Xiaoqi, the, uh, uh, who, who uh, is able to, uh, in 1961, April, he goes back to his own county and he sees the devastation and it's through, and then he brings in a team to do research for about 20 days where they map the, the, the devastation caused by the famine and then produce a report. And that is one of the reports that helps uh, convince the, the top Chinese leadership now in particular that things have gone horribly wrong. So in this case, it was actually an ethnographic mode of doing research that produced powerful knowledge. So again, it gives it, an, it's, you know, it can be biased, but it can also be very powerful in certain, certain moments. Um, so again, an important reminder of the value of different methods. Uh, on, on the ISI, I'm afraid I, I don't know much. There are other people who have written, as you, if you've followed the commentary in the past few years, that things are in, 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 you know, the ISI no longer enjoys the kind of prestige it did in the 50s and 60s. It's still uh, an amazing place for research, but it does not occupy the same, I think, status that it did in the 1560s globally. And there has been all sorts of sort of complaints about, of course, uh, the broader problems with statistics in India. I'm not qualified to comment on them, though I know that that things are are in are in bad shape now. So, yeah. uh, the next question is from Rija. No, um, she says that given how ideology was important in influencing statistical methods, how did the methods of counting evolve in the 1960s with the Sino-Soviet split and post 1978? Was there a shift of emphasis? Were there any debates happening around this time? Yeah, this is the, this is a great question. Thank you. Um, the uh, so uh, I, I didn't look at this in as much detail as I did for the fifties, but uh, what you do see is because of the so the Sino-Soviet split is hugely important because uh, uh, you know uh, uh, all Soviet experts that were present on the ground are withdrawn, um, and and. Uh, but in terms of the kinds of technologies and the approach that was already in place, a lot of that persists in the 60s and 70s with you know, a lot of variation and a lot of sort of, um, you have to look at specific cases. Uh, the statistics is, is interesting because in some ways after the Great Leap Forward when uh, you know, statistics as I, I briefly alluded gets fundamentally reshaped as an ethnographic exercise and you know, Mao's 1927 report gets, get, gets elevated to sort of theoretical, almost th theoretical status. Um, you, you see a whole range of sort of, there's an attempt at retrenchment in the early 60s under Liu Xiaoqi, but then with the chaos of the Cultural Revolution kicking in, you really, statistical app, the enterprise itself sort of uh, is, is, is largely, um, to, to the extent that it, ex it doesn't exist the way it did in the 50s, to the extent that it does exist, it's very atomized and it's sort of at the commune level itself from what we understand. And there is no sense of a national statistical apparatus or a national statistical or national statistical data. And this only really begins to change in the early 70s. So after the, the most chaotic phase of the Cultural Revolution is over uh, and you have an attempt again at, 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 at retrenchment that uh, provincial bureaus slowly start to be reestablished in the early 70s. Uh, and then this continues, you start after, you know, China joins, uh, joins the UN in the early 70s also, you see greater participation in a range of um, uh, essentially conferences, but also transnational scientific activity that includes also uh, statistical sort of exchanges. So you start seeing by the second half of the 70s exchanges that then provide Chinese statisticians with uh, sort of avenues for, for, you know, learning what is going on in other parts of the world and so on. And then there is a major debate that happens in 78 itself in as a part of the larger changes that are taking place uh, with, with Deng Xiaoping's uh, ascendancy where uh, some of the figures that actually were important in the 50s, including uh, a very uh, uh, influential professor of statistics by the name of Daishir Guang, who was a professor at Renmin University, who was one of the members of the delegation that Wang Sohua led to the ISI in, in December 56, January 1957. Uh, he writes a couple of essays where he basically says, we need to uh, move beyond this 
sort of socialist understanding of statistics and embrace a more universal understanding of statistics and so on. So that kicks off a whole range of debates in the, in the late 70s and early 80s also. But the fact that he wrote that sort of suggests that as a, as a, a doctrine, statistics remained very much in the socialist mode as, you know, i.e. statistics as a social science through the 60s and 70s in some ways, yeah. Um, uh, Rennie Thomas asks if you can talk about the growth of statistics as an academic discipline in the PRC during the historical period you have looked at. Yeah, hi Rennie, thank you for this question. It's uh, it's so it's one of the things that I did not uh, talk about today, but is is actually a chapter in the book. So I I I, I do hope you will you will get uh, you will you will read the book. Uh, and and the, one of the things that I'm really interested in, in, or I tried to do in that chapter, is really trying to understand. Uh, I saw this as an example of scientific closure, or you know, how is consensus formed, how has consensus arrived at? Because uh, what you see is, uh, you know, these obviously these debates that are going on with regard to the definition of statistics that have a huge Im impact on statistics as a discipline, and it is felt by in particular by those statisticians who enjoyed a, a significant amount of prominence pre-1949. And I look at in particular the case of one of these statisticians who was a major figure in the 30s and 40s. He was also a banker. He was arguably uh, the author of the most popular statistics textbook pre-1949. And in the 50s, he becomes the object of a, a sort of concerted attack because the kind of statistics he had espoused was problematic because it was arguing for statistics as a universal science that is equally applicable to the natural world and the social world and so on. So I look at him and then I, I try and understand not just him, but then the other sort of other figures that that, that surround that were that were sort of active at the same time and look at the kinds of critiques that were mounted and how, what, what you know how that sort of uh, how is it that you go from a one particular understanding of statistics to another within the academic community. Uh, and as you can imagine, given the the, the kinds of uh, um, methods that were used at that time and continue to be used in China in subsequent decades, you know, sort of uh, struggle sessions, self criticisms are very much a part of this. Uh, but there's also interesting sort of generational distinctions that emerge: how a younger set of statisticians are able to mobilize against an older set of statisticians. Um, and then in that chapter, I also look at actually how this affects not just uh, sort of the, um, uh, the the content of statistics, you know, so you so you sort of start seeing uh, things like variation, like correlation, uh, probability theory, more broadly speaking, all of these things are no longer being taught. So textbooks are being rewritten. Uh, but it also begins to affect the valuation of key statistical concepts, very sort of basic statistical concepts. So even uh, so, sort of um, um, uh, things like um, uh, uh, the mean, uh, the different kinds of mean that are used, for instance, and how they are to be evaluated, you know, sh should we rely on the arithmetic mean? Should we rely on the harmonic mean or the geometric mean? These things also become objects of of real debate and discussion. Uh, and it's interesting how, how, how they are resolved. Uh, and one of the things that I argue in the chapter is that a lot of the critiques that are mounted against, uh, uh, say, the approaches to, uh, to sort of these different kinds of uh, central tendency, as you will, or to, um, say, price indices, which is another, another topic that they discuss, the critiques are actually quite powerful. Uh, what, what they struggle with, of course, is coming up with alternatives to those critiques. Uh, so anyway, uh, I can keep speaking, but but I, if this is interesting, please do read the chapter, and I'd love to talk once you've read it, and we can, uh, I think, because it's, it, it, it's a fascinating story unto itself. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Partho Mukhopadhyay, uh, where he says that uh, when does China start using stochastic methods, and how does the change come about? How is the body of teachers formed? Was there a remnant in academia that acts as the seed? Uh, Yes, a, a, a great set of questions. Uh, there was a remnant, and I mentioned one of them briefly, someone like Dai Guang, who then becomes hugely important in the 80s. Uh, but the transition to a, a sort of more capacious uh, definition of statistics is a slow one through the 80s. And I have at least anecdotal uh, evidence that into the 1980s, so what you had in the 50s, and I should have mentioned this uh, in answer to Rennie's question also, is that you see within universities this very strong division emerge. If you are doing anything that has to do with probability, you end up in a math department, not in a department of statistics. Statistics then becomes the social science of statistics. And that distinction actually persists into the 1980s, where I have anecdot anecdotally been told that um, there are people who were in 
studying statistics but in a math department and didn't really ever encounter any kind of socioeconomic data. And the people who were in the stats department, that's what they dealt with. And, and it took some time in the 80s, I think, for this, uh, this, this sort of barrier to, uh, to, be, uh, to be surmounted. Um, but many of these people do are important. So I, I mentioned Daishu Guang, but also people like Wu Hui and Gong Jianyao, who are in fairly important positions uh, in the late 70s and early 1980s. In some cases, they are rehabilitated. Guang Jianyao, for instance, becomes the head of the, the Guangdong uh, Statistical Bureau, right? So he's, he's in charge of uh, one of the largest uh, provinces in China. And as they try and sort of bring back a lot of these methods, these people do play a significant role. But again, it's not, it's not a, these, are, these are things I've looked at only in passing uh, as I was trying to sort of uh, focus on the 1950s. Uh, but I think we can find the story and then we can sort of track it into the 80s, look at some of these individuals and of course, a whole range of new individuals who emerge. Um, and, and the other story that I think takes even longer in some ways is the adoption of the system of national accounts, which I think doesn't happen till the late 80s, early 90s. Of course, there's a lot of preparatory work that goes on. Uh, and it's sort of, I think it, it again parallels in some ways what happens in the Soviet Union also, uh, because the Soviet Union also follows a similar kind of timeline where it's in the 80s and into the early 90s that you, 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 see, uh, the, you, you see them discard uh, the NPS, the material product system and move towards the SNA. The system of national accounts. Uh, okay, uh, one more question from uh, Rajdeep Pakanati. Is there a global acknowledgement of India China science network in statistics or other science networks? Uh, <laughs> not, not that I know of. Um, so uh, you you would think there would there would be more work, but this is part of what I've now been doing. It's one of the one of the two projects I'm engaged with is to try and recover these kinds of instances of scientific interaction. Um, but uh, the UN, what's interesting is the UNESCO was actually deeply involved pre-1949. Uh, and uh, so people like, like uh, Joseph Needham, uh, people uh, on, on the Indian side, people like Homi Bhabha, people like uh, Didi Kosambi. Uh, on the Chinese side, you had uh, Chen Xingshan. Uh, and also perhaps Hua Luo Gang. There were, there were a whole range of people who were interested in setting up uh, sort of institutions of science in Asia. And a lot of this, these debates, if you look or discussions, if you look at them in 46, 47, um, had to do with trying to set up centers in China and India. So there was a recognition that these two countries would have to play an important role going forward. Of course, you know, the, the situation changes quite dramatically in 1949 when, uh, when uh, the CCP wins the civil war. Uh, and then um, even more dramatic, I think, is, is, is the, the Korean War, because up to 19, early 1950, uh, there was a sense that uh, the, the PRC would be, uh, would be admitted to the UN. But that didn't happen because of the Korean War. I think things got much, much more difficult. Uh, and so you see UNESCO no, no longer, I think, play a, as big a role uh, in, in, in this story. Uh, but the broader story of China and their scientific contact, I think, is an important one. It's a neglected one. Um, it's, uh, as I mentioned, uh, something that I'm, uh, one of the things that I'm working on now, and I just published, um, actually, uh, earlier this morning, it, 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 it came out, uh, a paper on uh, the collaboration between the Indian paleobotanist Birbal Sahani and his Chinese doctoral student, uh, a man by the name of Xu Ren. Um, and I, so if you're interested, I would, uh, I would encourage you uh, to... Uh, to look it up, it was published in the International Journal of Asian Studies. Uh, and again, I'm trying to sort of argue for how looking at these kinds of connections allows us to understand different aspects of the history of science in the 20th century, and not just you know China India relations, as it were, or, or something like that. Uh, so I think it's um, uh, the question that you're asking is a hugely important one because I think it's largely untapped. There's a whole there's a whole sort of world of stories that we just don't know about, and that can help us fundamentally understand. Uh, aspects of Indian history, aspects of Chinese history, aspects of uh, Asian history, aspects of um, even 20th century history in various ways. So thanks for that question. Okay, uh, I think that wraps up uh, the questions we have and I'm very glad that the last question comes back to the, came back to the issue of India-China, you know, um, science linkages or South-South more generally science linkages, uh, which is what you sort of started with. Uh, I just want to thank you, uh, Arunab, for this lecture. I mean, I have not read out all the comments which have said that this is a brilliant lecture and that the people really 
I think, gained a lot from it. I would uh, recommend to everybody to really read the book. If I can read this book, then others can too. <laughs> because first when I said science, so statistics, but it really throws light on, you know, through statistics, it throws light on really fundamental questions about state building in uh, early people's republic. And it also demolishes um, a lot of the kind of, as I said before, blinkers that are there, which prevent us from really looking at uh, areas of uh, research or knowledge deeply and seriously. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. And thank you everybody for uh, participating. We had a good set of questions also, I think. And uh, please yeah. do read the book. Thank you. Well, okay. Thank you so much again, Madhavi. I, I have taken the liberty of, of posting the link to the paper that I just mentioned. So, Rajdeep, uh, right. if you're interested, thank you also, Rajdeep, for sharing your uh, your the, your website and the, and the information about your course. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so it's open access, so anyone can anyone can download it. So, uh, I would love to hear what people have to have to say about that too. But no, thank you so much for for listening, and thank you so much for the terrific questions. Okay, we look forward to your next. <laughs> No, as you as you said, Madhuri, I do hope some of some of the people the dam, in the will now want to read the dam book. sounds really interesting, but I hope you get access to. Yeah, so the, the project on dam building, unfortunately, depends a lot on access. I'm trying to figure out how mm. to proceed now this summer. So. Okay, thank you, everyone, very much, everybody. Good evening. Good. Uh, have a good morning. Yeah, good. Day.